In this video, I want to overview chapter one. It's about matter and measurement, and there's three main areas that we study when we are looking at chapter one content. We are looking at dimensional analysis, we're looking at reporting measurements, and defining matter. So these are kind of our three main categories. So as an overview, I just kind of want to lay things out as a concept map. Um, let's change our color, actually. So let's start with matter. Uh, the chapter begins by introducing chemistry as a study of the behavior of matter and matter itself. Now, to study that, that means we have to study everything from energy to how matter reacts to how it behaves physically. The physical states for matter that we're going to cover in this class are solids, liquids, and gases. And we'll spend a lot of time in chapter seven going over these in more detail. And in chapter five, we'll track them with these abbreviations, S for solid, L for liquid, and G for gas. We also introduce mixtures. Uh, we've got homogeneous mixtures and heterogeneous mixtures. The homogeneous mixtures are going to be uh, uniform. You won't be able to distinguish between different components of the mixture. And the heterogeneous mixtures, you'll easily be able to tell the difference between the two. So an example of a heterogeneous mixture would be something like sand and water at the beach. The sand particles filter down to the bottom and it's easy to separate them. A homogeneous mixture might be something like simple syrup where there's, there's no way to tell where the water begins and the sugar begins or ends. The other component of matter is discussing the physical properties that we'll be tracking. And we'll be measuring these as well. So that becomes important when we're talking about reporting measurements. Physical properties are gonna be things like volume, uh, mass, density, uh, length or distance, and time and temperature are a few of those. And we were given metric units and English units for all of these. We're gonna focus on metric units when we report our measurements. And for some of us, that'll be easy because we already can think intuitively in metric units. And for some of us, that'll be hard because we're used to English units. Uh, so sometimes being able to go back and forth between those can be helpful to have a sense of scale. So when we report measurements, we also are always going to be very cautious of our units that we use. This will really be able to tell someone exactly the quantity or the size of what we're talking about. So all measurements have a number and a unit attached to it. So that way we can communicate what we're talking about. Um, our units are also going to have, um, sorry, different abbreviations for metric and for English units and conversions between them. And we'll talk about conversions and dimensional analysis. We are also given uh, some, some time focusing on the different temperature units in this chapter. A lot of us are familiar with degrees Celsius or degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, Kelvin is one we introduce and one we use a lot in chemistry because there are no negative values. The lowest possible temperature is zero, which is absolute zero, which means nothing has any kinetic energy and it isn't moving, uh, which we haven't obtained. We can get close and things get weird. Also, when we report measurements, we want to make sure everyone is comfortable with scientific notation. Scientific notation allows us to report really large and really small numbers in a way that is more uh, safe space. And in this class, we're going to talk about things that are huge and tiny. When something's really, really tiny and there's enough of it that you can hold in your hand, it means there's a huge amount of that tiny, tiny thing. And so we'll oftentimes be using uh, numbers that have 23 zeros after it or before it or 34 or 37. And those are huge and we're not gonna write them all out. So we use scientific notation. It'll always have the same format. There is always one digit first, followed by a decimal place, followed by the remaining digits. The number of digits to use will be the number of significant figures that the number has. 
then it's multiplied by 10 to an exponent. If this exponent is negative, it's a very small number. And if it's positive, it's a very large number. So an example would be 6,000 would be 6 point, well, let's say 6,000.0. 6,000 or 6.1234, I've got four significant figures, times 10 to the third. It's a positive number showing it's a, a, a positive exponent showing it's a large number. And then, okay, yeah, sorry, lost track. Uh, in reporting measurement, there's another big piece that is uh, something that creates a lot of confusion for students when it's first introduced, which is significant figures. And we use this a lot when we're working with dimensional analysis and conversions. So our significant figures are going to be the number of digits that we can report to communicate how accurate or precise of an instrument we used. And so the, that'll be our, our non-zero numbers. Um, there's a number of rules for zero numbers as well. And we'll walk through those in a lot of detail, especially with our lab activity for this chapter to get lots of practice with them and recognizing them. Um, but significant figures apply when we are using inexact numbers, which means these are numbers that we have measured. And we have two sets of rules for manipulating numbers with significant figures based on the type of calculation we're doing. Um, multiplication and division, operations have a different set of rules than addition and subtraction operations. Our addition and subtraction, we will always report the least decimal places when we are performing a calculation that involves a number that has significant figures. And with multiplication and division, we'll always report the least sig figs of any set of numbers that are inexact within a calculation. So I will say right now that the, the areas of this chapter that tend to cause the, I guess the most stress for students historically would be significant figures um, because there's those two different rules. And also deciding what is an inexact or exact number takes a bit of practice. The best way to internalize significant figures is to practice, practice, practice. Um, that's my best recommendation. Uh, so, moving on, uh, let's talk about dimensional analysis. That actually is also another area where uh, we try to, we bring this into the class early and right away so that way we get lots of practice with it. This is going to lean a lot on the uh, algebra skills you're bringing into the class. This is why we've got the math prereq that we do. Um, so, dimensional analysis we're going to use with clinical conversions. and metric conversions um, and metric to English conversions. And it's, it's a general problem solving strategy. So we can use it a lot. And as a problem solving strategy, what it's doing is it's using units like variables. to plan out a calculation. So let's bring this down a little bit. So looking at this, a way to make it more abstract would be to say that if you know a given set of units and you wanna convert that into a different set of units, we would multiply it by a conversion factor that it would we'd be set up as a fraction. So we'd multiply it by a fraction that had the, the units that you want on the top and the units that are given on the bottom. And when you multiply that given value by that conversion factor fraction, you'll end up with a number that's in the units that you want. Conversion factors are sometimes written as fractions and they're sometimes written as equalities.
when they're written as an equality, you can just take that equality and take this side and put it on the top and this other side and put it on the bottom. Let's look at an example of this. If I wanted to convert between milliliters and liters, which are both metric units, I know that 1000 milliliters equals one liter. If I have one milliliter, I will multiply this by a fraction that places the milliliter unit on the bottom and the liter unit on the top. So plugging in my um, conversion factors from the equality, one liter would be 1000 milliliters. I can see that when I multiply this all out, if I'm treating these units like variables, these milliliter units will cancel out, leaving me only with units of liters. And I'll get a value that's 0 0.001 liters. There's actually another O in there. I'll write it back down here. I'm reporting this, if this is a measured value, I have two significant fi figures right here. So I'm going to report it with two significant figures as well. The zeros that come before that one aren't considered significant. They're just placeholders. So when I'm looking at this, I can also convert it into scientific notation. That would be 1.0 times 10 to the negative 3 liters. Again, I'm still just reporting two significant figures. All right, so to kind of conclude, for chapter one, if I was going to focus on any, uh, just a few things, the, my priority would be, here, not B, P. So a priority list of what to focus on as you study is dimensional analysis, first and foremost. I think this will be the one tool you use the most in this class. And so it's a great idea to have a really strong foundation early on. After dimensional analysis, I would make sure that I'm familiar with, um, with my uh, significant figures as well. And these will take a lot of practice. Um, so for significant figures, I'll be comfortable with the addition and subtraction rule, the multiplication and the division rule, and I'll be comfortable applying these to multi-step problems. And when you're doing that, make sure you are assessing sig figs after each step. But that you're only rounding at the very end of the problem. One way to do that is when you're working on a problem, if this was a first step of many, I would put a little line underneath my last significant figure to keep track of it, but then keep all of my digits that are coming up in my calculator with me as I move through the problem until the very end and round at the, at the very end. Um, and then other than that, those are the two main things I would focus on. Of uh, smaller priorities, this is number one and number two, uh, the third and fourth priority I would say would be familiar with the density equation and using it as a conversion factor. And temperature conversions. These aren't going to use dimensional analysis. And so they're a little bit trickier when it comes to the sig figs. You'll get less practice with them. The one to really be familiar with is Celsius to Kelvin. If I want to know the temperature in Kelvin, I'll take the temperature that I have in degrees Celsius and add 273 to it, or 273.15 either one. And so that'll use the addition and subtraction sig fig rule, which will be that I report the least number of decimal places of any inexact number. Remember, anything that's part of a conversion factor, like this 273 is an exact number. So it doesn't have significant figures or it has infinite significant figures, whichever one you want to think of it as. Okay, that's my overview of chapter one. Let me know if you have any questions.